Scripture this morning is Acts 16, 9 through 15, from the New Revised Standard Version. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia, pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia. Being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them, we set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain name, woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira, and a purple and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home and she prevailed upon us. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word.
Beautiful, thank you. Four years ago, the week before the presidential election, I announced that I would be preaching a sermon entitled, Who You Should Vote For. Along with the outraged grammarians who chided me for not saying whom, there were people who attended worship that Sunday whom I had never seen before and haven't seen since. Several people the week before that Sunday nervously asked me if I was going to do something to put the church's tax-exempt status at risk. You folks are always so very attentive during the sermon, which is a very humbling thing. But on that Sunday, as I stepped into the pulpit, that attentiveness was accompanied by many furrowed brows and expressions of seriousness. It is indeed a fraught thing to preach on topics that are neither safe nor easy, particularly when they involve the intersection of what our obligations and opportunities are as citizens versus what those are as Christians. I know that this has not been a light sermon series, has it? And I'm grateful to you that you have stuck with me through these topics that are indeed oh so live in our culture and oh so hard to figure out sometimes how to think about amidst all the noise of the shouting around us. Today is another of those hard topics, immigration. And our task today, as it has been throughout this Easter season sermon series, is to try to ask how the good news of Easter and the new life that it portends can also offer us new life as we think about many of these hard things. Now, That sermon four years ago was a bit of teasing misdirection on my part, though, for while it would not be my place to ever tell you who or whom to vote for, I did use that sermon as the occasion to suggest how, how you and I should think about the privilege of voting, how we might think about the candidates in light of the Christian faith. So, not so much what or who, but how. And that's the same tack I want to take this morning and ask how the good news of Easter's promise of new life and the promise that we need not fear should should affect how we should think, how we might think about the topic of immigration. With all that in mind, I want to offer you four suggestions. First, don't oversimplify. The very word immigration is simply much too broad and therefore hides the fact that the story of those who have wished and will wish to come to this country is actually a complex and multifaceted one. Yet, from the media on the left or the right, you would think that immigration was something solely related to Mexicans and Middle Eastern Muslims. But actually, the largest group of immigrants to the United States every year are from India and China. You can also often hear that immigration to the United States represents these days an unprecedented percentage of the people in this country. Actually, in 2014, there were 1.3 million immigrants to the United States, which represented about one half of 1% of the population. In 1850, though, there were over 2 million immigrants to this country, more than a few of them ancestors of people in this room, which represented 10% 
of the country's total population. And in 1890, the total immigrant percentage of the population was 15%. Oversimplification helps none of us as citizens or as Christians to think about how to best understand and respond when the term immigration covers such a broad range of cases from the skilled scientific folks that the government actually courts to the tragically surprising number of unaccompanied children as young as five years old who are seeking to cross the border and whose ranks increase. As my mother used to say, for every complex question, there is a simple answer that's wrong. Second suggestion. Don't prevaricate, don't mislead, or to be blunt, don't lie. It's right there in the Ten Commandments. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. When you or I as followers of the Savior who told us that the truth would set us free, when we do not look with skepticism on some of the lies told about some of our Christian brothers and sisters, we do not honor Jesus, nor what he has asked of us in regards to our neighbors. You hear all the time, you hear all the time, and these lies are forwarded in dubious emails and trumpeted on Facebook. For example, that immigrants are responsible for the rising crime rate in this country. There are two lies here, though. Study. First, study after study after study going back for more than a century have shown that immigrants, whether legal or undocumented, are far less likely to commit crimes than native-born Americans. And that's true, whatever their education level, level or whatever country they hail from. Second, the crime rate in the United States over the last two decades has fallen dramatically, not risen. From 1990 to 2013, violent crimes in this country declined 48%, and property crimes declined 41%. There are, of course, very legitimate public policy discussions to be had about immigration. But when these discussions are fueled by our believing fear-based lies rather than the truth, then we do our faith and our country no service, and we violate the Ninth Commandment. There's an old saying that I've always liked, do not believe everything you think. Scientists tell us that on the average day, you and I will have about 70,000 different thoughts. These days, too many of those thoughts will likely be echoes from the noise around us that does not tell the truth about too many things. And those things may therefore be in your thoughts. But I invite you not to believe them, not to pass them on, not to act on them. Third, always remember, in the midst of thinking about this, always remember just how much of the Christian faith is the story of immigrants. It's often truthfully said that the United States is a nation of immigrants, but what is not as often recognized is that Judaism and Christianity are also formed by immigrants. From the story that is the beginning of the Jewish people's history when Abraham and Sarah left their homeland to Jesus' earthly family fleeing terrorism and immigrating to Egypt, to today's scripture. Our forebearers in the faith are often ones who followed a call to a new place. 
in the trust that God could and would offer them new life and transformation. And such journeys always change both parties, don't they? In today's scripture, Paul takes the gospel for the very first time into Europe. And there to greet him was Lydia and a band of women who were seeking something better for their lives, a connection to the holy that could change them and transform them. Paul gave them that. Yet Paul himself was also changed. As you know, in some of Paul's letters, he has some very troubling things to say about women. But his encounter with Lydia, the women of Macedonia, and Lydia's household changed him so that by the time he wrote his final letter to the church at Rome, he acknowledges and gives thanks for, thanks for the women who worked alongside him and to whom he accords the title of minister. You see, God is always seeking to nudge and push all of us out of our comfortable routines and past our prejudices to become new and better people. And God uses folks in new lands and new places to change us for the better, to make us more open to the fact that our neighbor, as Jesus put it, is someone we might have earlier feared. When we ignore God's promptings to go to new places in our lives, we often miss the opportunity to grow. Which brings me to my fourth and final suggestion of how we can think about immigration. Seek to be civil. Now that may seem like a pretty low bar, but it's not. Particularly in this season of our shared civic life, civility is too seldom seen. And as civility disappears, what takes its place are demonization and fearfulness and stereotypes that play to people's worst instincts. It's just uncivil and inaccurate to say, whether from the right or the left, that every Mexican is a rapist or that every Wall Street banker is a crook. Such uncivil language from whatever point of the spectrum. Such attitudes, and too many like them, make it that much harder for God to find us with the possibility of new life and hope, make it that much harder for us as Christians to, as Isaiah said, come and reason together. To seek to be civil in our conversations, in our thinking, in our Facebook postings, in the emails that we choose to forward, is to ask how we can learn from new opportunities and new people and new places God is calling us to instead of fearing, instead of assuming we must fear all of these. And after all, it's the attitude of civility that welcomed immigrants to the United States like Albert Einstein and Joni Mitchell and Neil Young and Cesar Chavez and Madeleine Albright and Alexander Solzhenitsyn and 30 Medal of Honor winners from among Mexican immigrants and the two Muslim generals, did you know this? who fought alongside George Washington's army and the Muslim doctor who in the 1960s revolutionized brain surgery and last but not least, the Muslim immigrant in 1904 who invented the ice cream cone, (laughs) for which I'm really grateful. A few years ago, a Disciples of Christ pastor in Indiana wrote the following words, quote, Religion should increase our honesty, civility, and compassion. It should not be used to make our politics even more polarized. I hope 
that these four suggestions that I have offered might indeed increase our honesty, civility, compassion as we as Christians and as citizens seek to think well and faithfully about this difficult topic. And you know what? When all is said and done, these four suggestions don't oversimplify, don't lie. Remember that the story of our forebears in the faith is often the story of immigrants and seek to be civil can really be summed up by these very wise words from the Apostle Paul, quote, watch your mouth, say only what helps, make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, or profane talk. Or perhaps from the more familiar King James version of Paul's words, let no corrupt communication proceed from your mouth, but only that which is good for edifying. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you and also all malice. It's not always it's not always an easy thing to do, is it? But it is the way of our God, the way of our Christ. It is the way to new life. May it be so. Amen.